Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is the Vermont Department of Libraries Tuesday Talk Series. My name is Vincent Lavodi. I am the statewide consultant for special populations. I'm also director of the ABLE Library of Vermont, which is a topic for another day. Uh, today we are here to talk about the Emerald Ash Borer. I am very happy to announce our partnership with um, this department. Department of Libraries, now, many of you may know, I'm sure, are already having your own events and awareness campaigns. This is Emerald Ash Borer Week. We are uh, in the midst of it right now. The Vermont Department of Libraries sent out posters and adjoining factual information to our network of libraries. We have been disseminating them. Um, so you can please look for your um, community libraries for more information, or you can contact um, the very nice folks here at the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. It is my pleasure. Oh, something to remind you all. There are some books and materials up at the back. Please feel free to take them. They are yours to take. They are free. These were donations to the Vermont Department of Libraries, and we are happy to pass them on to you. And I think you also put some things up there, too. So uh, those are for you to take, take and share. Um, I don't know, gifts, various things. All right. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Elise Shadler. Shadler, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes, is the Vermont Urban and Community um, Forestry Programs Technical Assistance Coordinator. Um, she is sort of on the front lines of helping towns prepare for and respond to the invasive emerald ash borer. Uh, she first moved to Vermont to pursue her Master of Science um, from the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources here at UVM. She's also an ISA certified arborist and a Burlington Master Naturalist. Uh, Elise enjoys spending quality time with her family and the good people that fill her life, which we hope now includes the department. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned before, May 18th to May 24th is Emerald Ash Borer Awareness Week. And um, we are a proud partner in promoting awareness and um, really helping to preserve our state's unparalleled natural resources. Welcome, Elise. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, can I just quickly get a lay of the land of who's, who, since we are such a small group, <laughs> um, maybe where you're from, if you work for the state, or if you're just here? I live in Montpelier. I have ash trees all around my house. Okay. Some of which will probably fall. Over. Okay. Great. <laughs> I live in East Montpelier, and we too have ash trees around. Great. Yeah. I live in Montpelier, and I'm just interested in the subject. Great. I'm from Plainfield, and I'm a member of the former um, Emerald Ash Borer Task Force in town. Fantastic. Jessica from Marshfield, ten and a half acres, lots of tall, lots skinny ash. ashes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Great. we're working with an arborist. Excellent. That, and just doing surveillance, but I wanted to know if I should be, like, I just want to be better informed. Sure. And know if there's other strategies I should use. Great. Excellent. And then you all are from the library, the Department of Libraries. And residents of Montpelier. And residents of Montpelier and East Montpelier. Okay. Excellent. Fantastic. OK, um, great. So I, I can talk about EAB um, ad nauseum. <laughs> so uh, it's just, just good to get a lay of the land and to, to know who's in the room. So um, you can kind of tailor to if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to, to interject. Um, I am, uh, by training, an urban forester. So I mostly in Vermont deal with uh, trees along the right of way and um, trees on town-owned land. So we're talking about trees around your libraries and your town um, offices, buildings, and um, on the town greens, around schools, parks, et cetera. Um, but mostly for the purposes of EAB, we're really talking about within the right of way. So um, does everybody know, does anyone not know what I mean when I say right of way? So this is along the roads. OK. Um, so I'm going to start with two really important websites. If you have never been to either of these or if you don't know about them, this, these are your two spots to go to in Vermont for Emerald Ash Borer information. Um, VTinvasives.org is, is the spot. It's the hot spot to go. Um, this is where you'd go. Are we connected to internet in this room? Or do we know? I can, I can check. I, well, well, we'll just check. Because um, if we are, then that'll be, it looks like. Yeah, OK, great. So I might just pop here real quick. 
um, and go to VT invasives. Um, so this site, um, the, the things that I just want to make sure everybody's aware of, these are kind of your takeaways from um, the presentation, is that uh, the big one is if you think you have Ermolar ash borer or if someone you know, someone in your town comes to you and says, we've got it on our property, we, we, we need to know about that or we would like to know about that. Um, the state's monitoring efforts for the current infestation and new infestations, um, we have limited capacity to be on the ground. So we're really dependent upon people actually reporting it. And there's this fun button here called report it. And what it, basically what it does is you can say, hey, I think I, I found an insect. I think it's EAB or signs of EAB. I think it's emerald ash borer by clicking here. Um, and then it gives you a big picture. So if you think you actually found the insect, it shows you what it should look like. It also gives you a link to all the lookalike pests that we often get people confused um, are confused that it might be EAB, and then you still think it's emerald ash borer, then um, it allows you to, to submit a photograph of the insect or the signs on the tree, if you're looking at a tree that you think is infested, um, the location, your name, and what, where this goes when you submit it is to not only the partners at the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation, where I work, but our partners at UVM Extension, um, at um, USDA APHIS, and at the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. So it's going to all those partners. So then everybody can kind of convene and say, OK, who wants to take this one? Who wants to go check it out if it looks suspect? Or you know, if it's not actually EAB, who wants to respond to this um, request? So that's one really awesome thing about this site. The other thing that um, you all should be aware of is that um, this, we have a whole section on emerald ash borer here. And um, so I'm going to be referring to a lot of documents that are on this website throughout the talk. I didn't bring, bring paper copies, but uh, we have you know, resources by audience. So forest landowners, for those of you who um, have, have actual forest land that has ash in it, here's information if, you, if you're um, in current use and you want to know about how that uh, how EAB is going to impact your forest management plan you can go here if you are a homeowner and just have a couple trees around your property you can go here and I'm going to talk about a lot of this stuff in the presentation but um, really gives you some step by steps if you're a volunteer and somebody from your town asks you to give a presentation on Emerald Ash Bar we have an EAB basics PowerPoint presentation with notes that's already recorded for you, so you can just steal it and use it in your town, and it has all the correct information in there. So um, this is a great website. And the last thing I'll just note is that there's this other button called the Listserv sign up. And this is for our EAB updates listserv. You sign up for this, and the only time you're ever going to get an email is when um, either a new infestation has been detected in the state. So as soon as it's confirmed, this, the email blast will go out um, to everybody on that e email list serv. Um, or if there's been a change in the quarant federal quarantine, or for example, we sent one out uh, a little earlier this year because in the state of Vermont, we just changed the official flight season for Emerald Ash Borer from May, starting on May 1st to starting on June 1st. So that's, um, that's just a you know, good thing for folks to be aware of, that, that that flight season is shortened in Vermont because of our colder climate and shorter growing season. Um, so that's VT Invasives. And then just to quickly show you the other site, which is um, vtcommunityforestry.org. That's our program's website, Vermont Urban and Community Forestry. And a couple things to note here. Um, all are from a couple different towns here. So, um, you know, one thing that's good to, good to know about is that we have um, Emerald Ash Borer planning grants that uh, are now active. We had 20 recipients this year. Um, here's all the towns that are getting funding from us. They're pretty small. It's only $2,000 a piece, but um, just some seed money for communities that want to do some planning. So this is municipalities and nonprofits are eligible, not private homeowners. But um, just East Montpelier is one of our recipients this year. Um, just so you can see, uh, that, that generally gets uh, announced in November, December. And then uh, the other piece on here is we have this whole section on Emerald Ash Borer Management. A lot of these resources are on both websites, so they're on that VT Invasive site as well. But because our program is really focused on uh, assisting communities and municipalities, this has um, 
more on the municipal planning resources, uh, treatment, insecticide treatment resources, budgeting, and then um, we've worked with several towns in the past couple of years to write management plans or preparedness plans. So these are all linked to the town. Um, so these are examples of communities that have actually established a plan. So um, Montpelier is actually one of our really has been a very active community in Emerald Ashbor planning. Those of you that live here probably have heard a lot about it. Um, but uh, since probably 2012 or 2013, you've had a, your tree board has been really active and um, being ready to, to prepare for the for the pest. So, just wanted to start with those two websites, um, and now we'll go back to the presentation. Um, Ta da! There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pests to start off with, and this is um, not a life-size replica of EAB, but this is actually a costume that one of our volunteers who lives in Johnson, Vermont, uh, made for the program a couple years ago, and it's been a great outreach tool because it's funny and, <laughs> and anybody can wear it. So, um, so the story of EAB in Vermont is just unfolding. That's uh, something that I like to, to preface with, and I also like to preface with uh, in an ideal situation, EAB is not going to be a big deal for you. And the reason that I say that is because right now we are at the cusp of the infestation. We are just starting to deal with it. And if you make a plan uh, for your trees, whether it be a homeowner, a forest landowner, or a municipality, if you have a plan in place, we have time now. It's, it's not going to be um, for another eight, nine years before we start really seeing the high mortality rates uh, across the state. So we have time. If you make a plan now, you, you know what your course of action is once you know the infestation is on your property or in your neighborhood or in your community. Um, that, is, that is my hope. So hopefully it's not a big deal. <laughs> From the other 30 some states that have been dealing with EAB, uh, we know that that's not always the case. And there are communities that have gone bankrupt because of the impacts of this pest. Um, there are home insurers that have, um, have sent uh, letters to their insurees saying if you don't remove the ash trees that are in proximity to your house we won't insure you anymore we know that's happening so um, so it's good to be aware we're here now it's all about EAB awareness um, this is National EAB Awareness Week and uh, the best thing for us in Vermont to be doing right now is again making sure people know about EAB know where their ash trees are and have a plan in place um, and a course of action for what they're going to do when they need to make a decision about those trees. Um, this is a better representation of the pest itself, and I'm actually going to go ahead and send around. I have two sets of um, a pair of vials, one with the adult EAB and one with the larvae. So I'll send one around here, and I'll send one set around here. And you'll see right off the bat that the pest, it's the, the adult is really small. It's a really small insect. Um, it's about the size of a penny. You could sit it on a penny, so just about half an inch uh, long. And uh, the scientific name is Agrillus planipennis. It hails from um, Eastern Asia, so Korea, Japan, China, Russia. That's where the native habitat of this pest is. And there really wasn't much known about it at all <laughs> until it landed here in the US, and the reason for that is that in its native habitat, it's kept in check by natural, natural predators. Um, it's the ash trees, the native ash trees in its native habitat are adapted to deal with this. So much like our native ash borers, our native beetles here, um, they're not an issue, so there really wasn't much, much research that had been done about them. But it's been here in the US since the mid-90s, first detected in 2002 in Detroit. And um, we know that uh, it feeds on all species of ash, which is the genus Fraxinus. So all species of ash trees are susceptible, and if they are untreated, over 99% of, of trees in the US will die, ash trees in the US. So there's very, very little natural resistance in our native ash species in the US. So it's, there's, that's a, it's a hard number to swallow, but it's over 99%. Um, the adult is actually not what kills the tree. 
uh, it is a, it's a marginal leaf feeder, so it does feed on ash leaves, but it's not, the defoliation of the tree is not what kills the tree. What kills the tree is the larvae. Um, so that wormy looking um, kind of beige <laughs> insect that uh, is walking around the room right now. Um, and how it kills the tree is that uh, as it's growing um, underneath the bark, as it's going, moving through the different larval stages and becoming an adult, it's feeding on the cambial layer of the tree. So this is, if you know anything about tree biology, this is the layer uh, right underneath the bark where all of the nutrient and water exchange is happening within that tree. So the roots are getting water and they're pulling nutrients from the soil. They're sending those up to the branches so that the, the leaves can photosynthesize. Those leaves are photosynthesizing, creating food, sending, sending those carbohydrates back down to the roots so that whole tree can function. And all of that's happening right underneath the bark layer in this, in this active live cambial layer. And that's what EAB larvae really like to eat. <laughs> so that's what they're feeding on. So the other thing that I'm gonna send around now are a couple of samples of, um, of the wood where you can see these characteristic S-shaped galleries. So EABs really, so if, if you've ever, you know, thrown wood into your wood stove or looked, explored a piece of a log of wood or a, log, a piece of down wood in the forest, you might, these might look somewhat familiar. Most um, wood boring beetles make some kind of feeding gallery, but the EAB is very distinctive in this very curvy S-shaped design in their feeding galleries. So I'll send some of these around as well. Uh, and this is what kills the tree eventually, because it essentially is cutting off the circulatory system of the tree over time. So if you have one or two EAB in a tree, uh, that tree could live for a very long time, but the as the population um, in an individual tree reaches a density, that's when it essentially becomes riddled and it cuts off the circulatory system. So this is just explaining a little further what I just, just mentioned, but this is the life cycle of the EAB. So um, the flight season of Vermont, when the adults are emerging and they're active, again, is from June 1st until September 30th. So that's our active flight season. So these, this is when those adults are emerging. Um, this is, you know, not actual size because, you know, very small. <laughs> um, but they're, they're uh, emerging out, they're going, they're feeding on the leaves. Um, when the females lay their eggs, they go kind of walk back over, start in the canopy first because that's where they're feeding, right? They're near, it's near the leaves. Um, so the infestation will start up in the canopy and move down the trunk of the tree over time as uh, it becomes more crowded. There's less real estate in the canopy. They'll start moving down to the, to the trunk of the tree. Um, so they'll lay their eggs. The, the larvae will hatch and they burrow directly underneath the bark. And here they go through their different larval stages. Um, for one, and they'll overwinter for one to two years. So at low density, they'll sometimes overwinter for two years. Um, and at higher densities, they'll overwinter for just one year. So they're just staying for one winter, then they're emerging and starting the whole cycle again. So that's the general life cycle. Um, and these are some of the uh, pests that, from our experience, uh, people have mistaken to be EAB. So this is the actual emerald ash borer up here. Um, it is, it's very iridescent, so it's unique in that sense. Um, it has a really flat head at the top, and you guys have seen, I mean, it's hard, it's very small again, so it's hard to actually distinguish these small features. But um, this is actually the one that, in my experience, most people have um, mistaken for EAB, the, the tiger beetle. Um, but, you know, something like a metallic wood borer also looks quite similar to an EAB. So this is why it's important that we have these posted up on that website. And then again, if you think you're, what you're looking at is emerald ash borer, report it and then we'll make sure. It's better to, to send it in and be wrong than to second guess yourself and not send something in. Um, I'm gonna go over some of the signs. And you guys out on the table out there, one of the, um, one of the posters we have available that we sent out to all the, the Department of Libraries sent out to all of the, the libraries in the state for us um, is this new uh, poster we have that highlights how to identify ash trees and then also what are the signs of EAB. Um, from our experience here, so, so we've 
first detected EEB in Vermont in uh, February of 2018, so just over a year ago. And um, it's really hard to see these early signs of infestation. So when, what happens when a new infestation is detected is that uh, the state, so FPR and our partners, um, we do a visual survey of all of the roads in that town. So the first um, infestation was in Groton. So w the, the state split up everybody into cars. You had like four people in each car and drove every single road in that town to do a delineation survey. So basically any trees, that ash trees that were looking suspect, we'd stop and look and um, decide if those might be um, infested with, with EAB. I was part of this process up in Milton because the, there's a South Hero infestation, so all the towns around each infestation are also surveyed. And um, just an experience of being in that car for eight hours and looking at ash trees for a day, it's really hard to see signs of early infestation of EAB. Compounded by the fact that ash in general, if you know the species at all, has a lot of other issues. <laughs> um, ash yellows, uh, there's a, a white fungus that grows on the bark. Um, the bark of, of ash, if it's rubbed, it kind of will, will fleck off to an extent. So you might think you're seeing a sign that's actually not a sign of EAB. Um, and um, e ash also grows really well in disturbed soils, so green ash particularly along that right of way. And that's not necessarily always the most healthy habitat for a tree, so they kind of look gnarly anyway. Um, so all this being said, we get requests sometimes from folks saying, I really want to see like an infested site so I can go check it out. And we are, again, at such an early phase that we're really not seeing it widespread. It's, I can't tell you, go look at this stand of ash and you'll see it. Um, it's, it is really hard to see. But I'm going to go through the signs kind of in, in um, timeline order of when they're going to show up when you're looking at an individual tree. So the first thing you're likely going to see is woodpecker flecking. So woodpeckers like to eat the larvae. And remember, they're just underneath the bark. So if you're seeing deep, large woodpecker holes um, that are going into the heartwood of the tree, that's not likely signs of EAB. That's, that's likely the tree is decayed for some other reason, and they're going after something else a little further in, but just right under the bark. So what that looks like is what we call blonding. So it's just this flecking off of um, the top layer of bark just so you can get, get right under that bark and get the larvae. Um, and like I said before, the infestation will likely start in the canopy, upper canopy, and move down. So this would be something you'd see higher up in the tree um, before you'd see it at, at eye level. Um, the next thing that would happen, because if you think about the, the impact on the tree, is that the canopy will start to thin out. The, the uh, circulation, that circulatory system, that exchange of nutrients and water is being impacted. So the, the leaves aren't getting what they need to photosynthesize. And likewise, those nutrients aren't coming back down. So you'll start to see this canopy thinning. And I'll walk through like, what the timeline of this kind of looks like. But this is kind of the next sign. Um, bark splitting is another thing that you might start to notice higher up in the tree. Um, so when um, the, the larvae starts to burrow and is eating in those feeding galleries, the tree will try to uh, repair that damage. And sometimes what man how that manifests is the bark actually splits around those, those feeding galleries. So this is another, another sign. Um, as the tree is, starts to get really stressed out because it's not, getting, it's not getting its food source, it will send out epicormic branches or water sprouts. And these are really common on a species like, um, like crab apples. You see them all the time. And it's just how that species kind of jams. <laughs> they like to put out water sprouts. But on ash, you'd see them kind of concentrated right in, um, in the core of the tree or down around the base. And this is that tree trying to put out as much green as possible so it can actually feed itself. And then, you know, we used to say this as the first one, but now we say it as one of the last is looking for the actual exit holes. So when the larvae finish developing, when they emerge as adults, um, they come out in D-shaped exit holes. So I'm going to send one last sample around. <clears throat> and 
uh, because remember that ash borer has a really flat top of the head, the, the shape of the exit hole is very distinctly D. It's not an oval, it's not a circle, it, it is a D, but it's very small. And again, the, the infestation starting in the canopy and moving down. So uh, to see these from the ground up in the top of the tree, by the time you can see them at eye level, that, that infestation has probably been going on for quite some time. And then the last thing you'd look for, and the reason this would be the last one is because you have to peel the bark to be able to see it, are those S-shaped galleries. So this is when we, get a, when we get a call in saying we think the tree is infested, we go through all those other um, signs first. Um, and then if it looks like it's probably a positive, then we would ask for permission from the landowner or from the municipality to peel the bark and actually start looking for some of these galleries. So this is, uh, this is that S shape, S shape, S shape, um, and then do a couple more peels and you get a little bit more deeper. See, very meandering, that's just that feeding pattern. <clears throat> um, so those are the signs and symptoms. <laughs> um, in Vermont, uh, switching a little bit to our ash population, so so FIA is forest inventory analysis, and that's how we have an estimate of any species distribution in the state. So that's, these are long-term monitoring plots done by the Forest Service, and that data has, tells us that we have about five to seven percent um, of our forest cover is ash. And those, the three species we have in Vermont are white ash, green ash, and black ash. Uh, there are 16 species across the U.S., um, across North America, I should say. Um, but those are the three that we have in Vermont, white, green, and black. Um, we know that it's about five to seven percent of our, our forest trees, and that's about 160 million trees. And it's scattered, you know, scattered in distribution across the state. So this is an important point to note, that um, there are many stands, like up in the islands, so Grand Isle County, uh, where an individual stand could be comprised of up to 70% of ash. So in some places, it's just scattered across the landscape, but there are other, are other places in the state where it makes up a much larger component, and they will be impacted um, more heavily than, than elsewhere. Um, white ash uh, is a, is a, you know, has market value. Um, the lumber is used for flooring, for handles, for bats. Um, so there are concerns around um, making sure if you are gonna harvest, uh, that, that, the, that the wood still has value. This is, I'm gonna talk about forest land. This is outside of my wheelhouse. I'm an urban forester, so specific questions around um, timber lumber and silvicultural management of ash. Um, I'll go over it, but that's, those are questions for your county forester or um, for one of our um, utilization foresters. In our urban forests, so, when I say urban, I know people are like, what, we're in Vermont. <laughs> but what I'm really meaning is places where people and trees are intersecting. So this is again along the right of way, rural right of way is included within that. So um, we've done a lot of tree inventory work in our downtowns. So worked with about 35 towns since I've been with the program for the last six or seven years uh, to inventory their downtown trees. And through that, we're able to pull out exact numbers of how many ash um, and where those ash are. So just some examples of you know, a place like Hyde Park, they've got four ash trees in their, in their um, public space, in their downtown. So it's not a big deal for them at all. Like they, and those are, those are ash trees that aren't actually not that large. So, um, but whereas you have another community like, you know, Burlington has over 1,200, green, mostly green ash that are planted in the green strip uh, in front of homes on, in residential areas in our parks. Uh, I'm a resident of Burlington, and I'll talk a little bit about, more about what Burlington's doing. Um, or a place like Essex Junction, which is a village, it's a small municipality, um, and they still have 141%, 141 or 17% of their, all of their trees that are planted and managed in town are ash. So you know, they have some decisions to make, too. Um, these two down here, um, these are examples of, of rural right-of-way inventories. So these are um, surveys along the rural roads that, you know, I know in East Montpelier and in, I don't know in Marshfield if you guys are doing, I don't know. you don't know. I know Plainfield, we've been in discussions and my colleague Joanne's going to be working with Plainfield to do, to conduct a rural um, 
inventory. So just to, you know, a sense like the, the town of Randolph estimates they have about 6,000 ash trees of over six inches in diameter along their rural right of way. So this is the larger concern on my end, um, in my perspective, just understanding that for a lot of our rural communities whose vegetation management along that right of way is generally taken care of by their road crew or um, by public works department or the, the road foreman, um, that now this is another thing on top of their plate um, that they need to be thinking about. <clears throat> um, just some information about the silvix of white ash. Um, you know, one thing that I think is interesting, and I didn't mention, is that so white so ash in general is a really good stump sprouter. So even when trees trees come down, they shoot up stump sprouts. EAB will infest one inch stems. So there there was a thought at the beginning of this infestation in the Midwest in Michigan, EAB will run out of food and then it'll leave that part of the world and it'll move elsewhere and then we can regenerate the second generation of ash. Um, and what we're finding is that it's persisting on the landscape because ash that are dying are sending up sprouts and those are becoming infested. So um, it's not likely that, it's, it is more likely than not that EAB is here in, the, in North America to stay for the long haul. Um, not the best news, but that's, Good to, it's good that we know that. Um, uh, ash is generally a pretty fast-growing tree, um, and uh, but white ash doesn't bear seed until 20 years. So that's another important thing to think about: is that um, is that losing our large diameter, 20-year-old ash um, in the long haul is is going to provide many gaps in our forests, um, and they're never gonna get big again. <laughs> um, and I will say, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, there, there is some resistance to EAB. So you know, the, the little bubble of hope on the horizon is that uh, a very small percentage of native ash trees are um, displaying tolerance, if not resist, resistance. So the difference there is tolerance is like, they won't die in five years. An individual tree might last 10 to 15 years. So it's, it's fighting back. Um, it eventually will succumb, but it, it's fighting back. And very, very rarely resistance to EAB. So there is certainly a case for leaving trees standing um, if they're not going to pose a threat to your house, <laughs> to people that are walking on a trail, um, if you don't need to get an economic return on those trees um, by selling it for firewood or lumber, et cetera. Uh, there is there is a case to be made that um, there could be resistance on our landscape. So um, the only way we're going to find out about that is if we leave trees standing. A um, little bit on ash ID. Uh, no, your ash from your elbow. <laughs> so this again, um, you know, it's interesting as as someone who works in urban forestry and has touched thousands of green ash trees in my lifetime. Um, I don't think about ash ID because it to me it's just so easy to see and our feedback from workshops that we've done from our county foresters who are on the ground working pr with private landowners is that the most questions we're getting in year one is not how do I see the signs of EAB it's what's an ash tree <laughs> what does it look like so we're really kind of shifting focus to spend a little bit more time when we're training volunteers when we're um, doing these kind of talks to talk about what an ash tree actually looks like because if you don't know what it looks like then we can't you can't move forward in any with any planning for for the pest um, so I'll just throw go through some slides you know it's it's a deciduous tree <laughs> um, it has a pretty um, full crown and and in the winter time it's really easy to I for me it's much more easy to ID ash in the winter when the leaves are off than in the summer and the main reason is is that the twigs on ash um, are they stay thick all the way to the end they're stubby there's st and so you can kind of see it here that they don't taper out like with a maple or an elm the, the actual as the tree branches out um, they get thinner and wispier but with ash that doesn't happen they just stay pretty um, thick all the way down. It's also opposite branching instead of alternate. So um, the branches come off, the buds come off the main stems directly across from each other, opposed to with most species, deciduous species, you have it kind of up and down 
alternating across the, the branch. So um, in Vermont, you know, the other species in our native species that do that are the maple species. So um, if you can tell the difference between a maple and an ash, then you're, you're in a good place to start with. Uh, fall foliage wise, uh, the white ash have a really beautiful like maroon color and the green ash generally start with a yellow and deepen to, to um, a darker orange. The bark is pretty characteristic, um, but it looks like other, a lot of other things. I'm gonna go through some lookalikes real quick. And our leaf is, it's a compound leaf with um, five to nine leaflets. So these are all little leaflets and it has one terminal leaf here that has a nice point at the end. Um, this, is the, this is a flower, actually, of an ash. They're, it's an inconspicuous flower, but they do flower. It's a wind-pollinated species, so it's not um, pollinated by um, insects. Trees that we, we see often uh, confused with ash, um, box elder is a big one. Um, it's a maple, so this is an acer, not, it, it's, it's in the maple family. Um, but it has a compound leaf, which is different for a maple tree. So this is the ash over here. This is the box elder. Um, there are, you know, the, the way the ash leaf doesn't have any lobes, whereas on the box elder you'll have these little tiny lobes that are like the maple leaf has those lobes. Um, we actually had a woman in Charlotte that paid an arborist um, a lot of money to treat three box elder trees for emerald ash borer. So this is something we heard from the Midwest that was going to happen here, that people would come in and say, oh, we can treat your trees. Um, but this individual didn't even identify the trees correctly. <laughs> so she got her money back and, and you know, got some ex expert opinion on, on that. But that's something that we just want to, again, the first step is making sure you know exactly what tree is going to be impacted. And it's only ash trees. Um, Mountain ash is another one, just because of the name that people often uh, will confuse with ash. It's, it's confusing, but it's actually not a fraxinus. It's sorbus is the genus. So this is a tree that will not be impacted by EAB. Uh, walnut, sometimes because of the bark, looks somewhat similar um, and also has that compound leaf. Hickory, um, not shag bark, definitely, hopefully not, because shag bark hickory has such distinct bark, but that's just one example. Um, and a yellow wood, which is not something you'd find in the woods here, that's an urban, an urban tree. Um, as with Kentucky coffee tree, we don't see that in the woods here. <laughs> um, so a little bit about, I've been mentioning that we're here on the cusp. So this is the general, the timeline of what, how EAB has played out in the 30 some other states that now has Emerald Ash Borer. So what we're generally seeing is, is so we, we assume that in the central infestation, which I'll show the map in a little bit, but the Montpelier, Groton, um, Plainfield, Orange, that whole area of the infestation, it's probably been here for three to four years um, in those areas. So what we're really seeing is that the population is gonna crest around eight to nine years. So the population will build, will build, will build. Um, and following that, is going to be the death curve, <laughs> where the highest mortality of ash is going to happen. So that's coming around year 10, um, is when just behind that population bump, you'll see that um, the, large, the large bump in mortality of the ash trees. And this is how it plays out on a tree-to-tree -tree basis. Five years um, from infestation to death of the tree, if it's not treated. And you. Five years, so year, the, year zero, uh, healthy tree. Year one, trees infested. Um, you're not gonna see signs of this. Year two, infested, you're probably not seeing signs of it. Year three, you might just start to see some dieback and some of that woodpecker. So it's two or three years before you really can visually see what's happening. Um, by year four, you get this thinning and die back, and by year five, the tree's dead. So it's very fast. So you may really only have three years from when you're seeing signs to when the tree has succumbed to EAB. Um, and is it too late then to treat? So um, you can treat up to 
um, they, the general rule of thumb is about if, if more than 30% of the canopy is looking thin, it's probably too late because then you're likely here. Um, so what we're really recommending is if you want to treat trees, um, if you're within the infested area on our map, this is, you should do it this year. Yeah. So and we'll t I'll talk about, I'll get into to what that looks like. Um, I talked about this already. So this is that um, tolerant and resistance. Uh, there are cross-breeding breeding programs that are already established in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois. So these are, there are people that are going out, finding those trees that are showing some tolerance or resistance. Um, taking cuttings from them, going back crossbreeding them with the native Asian varieties of ash. So much like we've learned with chestnut, American chestnut and American elm, these crossbreeding breeding programs will um, at least allow us to have some degree of native ash on the landscape for the long haul. Um, but again, this is, it's not appropriate in, in my view to leave trees uh, if they're going to impact human safety or property, if they could cause property damage. So um, this is a case for leaving trees out in the woods where they can't cause any, any um, risk. Um, zipping through a little bit of the history, we were, I already covered a lot of this, but uh, these are all, every red dot represents a county that now has EAB. So this is the, this might have need a new update, but they, they update this pretty regularly. Uh, emerald ash borer info.org is the website where I get a lot of this stuff. Um, it's the national EAB. But it's in 35 states and five Canadian provinces. It is here. It's not, we are not eradicating this pest from, from the US. Um, it moves about one to two miles. It'll fly for food. So if, if it can't find any ash, it'll fly one to two miles, the adult well, um, in a year. But we know that. If that was the case that it was only naturally flying, it would take over 400 years for EAB to get from Michigan to Vermont <laughs> or to New England, and it took less than a decade for it to show up in New England. So we know that we're spreading EAB. Um, if you think about the life cycle of the pest, it's right under the bark, it's overwintering, people cut down trees, ash is a great firewood, uh, throw it in the back of their truck, drive it to their camp, their hunting camp or uh, in the summer when they're camping three states away. That's how it's moving. Um, we don't have obviously much data to say if it's more firewood versus, you know, wood packing products versus along our rail lines, but um, the South Hero infestation popped up at a public, at a private campground. So we know that firewood is a big way that this, this is traveling. We have a firewood quarantine in Vermont since 2015. Uh, it's really hard to enforce uh, if you don't have all of the campgrounds on, on board. Um, this is just an example of uh, a colleague of mine um, was at a wood-fired pizza place in Salem, Massachusetts before EAB was in Massachusetts. And he went up and just started kicking around the pile. And lo and behold, found this piece of ash wood with a very obvious gallery. This wood was heat treated. So he did not bring EAB, this, this is not the introduction of EAB to Massachusetts, but just, to, just goes to show that it's very easy to transport it and think of all the places that use wood for heating. Um, I'm gonna skip this because we're running out of time, but this is our Vermont map. <clears throat> um, so uh, there's been a lot of confusion on how to read this map. So I'm just gonna give you the, the quick and dirty. Each red dot, so each red circle represents a five mile radius around a known infested tree. So, so there is a known infested tree in South Hero. We draw a five mile radius around that. That red area, um, it is more likely than not that EAB is, is active in that area and has been here for a while. The orange, the yolk, <laughs> we call these the eggs, but the, the orange is another five miles out beyond that border. So it is likely that EAB is in that area. So these are the towns where we know EAB is in. Barry, Crotton, Montpelier, Orange, Plainfield, South Hero, and Stamford. Stamford's down here. Um, the areas in the red are these towns. And then these are our high risk areas where it's likely that it's going to pop up. Uh, we are just getting into the flight season, June 1st. So this map will likely change a lot this year. Um, if you want to be in the loop, then you go back to that EAB updates listserv. <clears throat> um, 
Our state decided to not uh, adopt a county by county quarantine. Some other states have done so. Uh, it has, has been, um, most of the states that have started with a countywide quarantine end up dropping it over time. Again, it's really hard to enforce. We're a small state with limited capacity and resources. So what we've decided to put our, our uh, energy into is um, making sure people are aware of ways that they can slow the spread by having these recommendations. If you're moving wood, if you're moving ash wood from an infested area to a non-infested area, we have guidelines on VT invasives about how to do that. If you're hiring an arborist to come clear some of your ash trees, there are guidelines and recommendations on how to most safely remove, uh, dispose of that wood without impacting a non-infested area. So slow the spread is the big message. Um, vtinvasives.org. There's a whole section called slow the spread and there's about seven different sheets that give you, if you want to treat your wood, what are the specifications of that treatment, heat treating or bark removal, et cetera. That's all on that website. Um, there is a federal quarantine. So all the states, all 35 states are within a federal quarantine. That will likely be dropped uh, next year. There are, um, it is, it's, it's kind of a lost cause as far as the federal government is concerned. EAB is, they can't control it. And there are some other pests on the horizon, like the spotted lanternfly, anybody, anybody, <laughs> um, that is impacting New York and Pennsylvania right now that the, the federal government is really shifting focus from EAB onto this, this new pest. Um, nonstop. <laughs> um, we, we have been for years and years uh, working to detect EAB. You may have seen these purple prism traps or these green funnel traps. Um, these actually were, were set by uh, USDA APHIS. That program is getting defunded. So this year we, we're doing something new. We're actually, we uh, asked volunteers to uh, set the traps and record and monitor the traps, which is kind of a really cool thing. We have about 50 people across the state that are coming to trainings. They're gonna put the traps up around their town or on their property. Um, they'll, they'll do the surveying and the monitoring of the traps and then they'll take them down. So, um, I, you know, I've for years said, oh, they're not effective, but the Stamford, Vermont infestation, they found two EAB on purple traps. They haven't, have yet to find a tree that is infested or that they can see that's infested, but those were found on purple traps. Um, we sacrifice ash trees. So this is something we do at the beginning of the flight season, actually girdle, you, it's a, called a trap tree, so you girdle the tree. This is something you can do on your private property too, for those of you who have, who have land. Um, there are, I believe on VT invasives are um, guidelines for how to establish a trap tree. Essentially you're girdling the tree, you stress it out, It's it's easy food for the EAB, so they'll be attracted to the pheromones the tree's putting out. They infest that tree. You cut it down at the end of the flight season and peel the bark, and then you can monitor how many EAB are in that tree. Um, and also, then you burn it, and then you kill all those larvae. So it's another way to kind of slow the spread. Um, as far as making a plan, which is I'm sure what all of you really want to do <laughs> when you go home today, you have three options. And that's, I mean, it's pretty simple. We can get into all the details, but the three options are you treat the tree with an insecticide, you remove the tree, either before it's infested or as it's starting to show signs, um, or you do nothing. And this last option, again, is only appropriate if it's not gonna impact human safety or property. Um, it's really important to know that EAB impact, trees that are infested with EAB, um, they lose, the wood loses its integrity really quickly. And I've heard um, a, the, the anecdote that I will say is that um, uh, ash trees that have been killed by EAB at year five have the structural integrity of a styrofoam cup. They are very dangerous to work in, they're brittle and they shatter. So they don't behave like normal trees when they die. Um, so if you're going to wait to remove the tree, um, you have to be really, really careful. A lot of the arborist companies will not climb an ash tree anymore. They will only remove ash trees that are, sh they will not climb an ash tree in the winter when they can't see the foliage. They will um, only remove an ash tree by crane 
um, in the summertime it, or by a lift. So that means the price is gonna go up if it's showing more than like 25% canopy um, loss. So this is an argument for um, planning ahead of time and having a plan in place. There are communities such as Charlotte that are actually preemptively removing their rural right-of-way trees because they do not want to be in a situation in eight years when they have thousands of dead ash trees along their right-of-way and um, the cost to remove those trees is astronomically higher than it would be while they're still alive now. So these are, these are decisions that individual entities, a homeowner, a landowner, a municipality makes based on their risk threshold and based on how many ash trees they have that they know that they're going to have to make a decision about. Why, why removal? You might be getting to some of yeah. but why removal other than treatment? So is there well, failures? Like, no, I mean, do you, it, I think that for municipalities, you know, you're, there's a perception about insecticides. So do people, are people into that in your community? Are they okay with chemically injecting trees? Um, you have to treat every other year for the life of the tree. So it's a long-term commitment. So um, it's a great, for homeowners, I think it's a really great option. If you have a high value ash tree on your property that you want to preserve, it actually could be cheaper to treat that tree over time than to remove it if it's between two houses or by a utility line or it's large diameter. It actually could be cheaper over time. So it's not always, this is not always the more expensive option. Um, for me, for municipalities, what just concerns me is that long-term commitment, because you have one, one year where the budget's um, impacted for some other reason, and you can't treat that year, and then all the years ahead of that that you treated are just a wash. So it, it's, that's the big piece, is it, it is a long-term commitment. Um, but they're very effective. The, the chemicals, the um, insecticides, that the two that the state of Vermont is, is recommending are these two. There are many others on the market. So this is another thing. We really don't want homeowners going onto Amazon.com and putting in EAB killer um, because there are bark sprays and foliar sprays and soil drenches that are full of, you know, Lord knows what <laughs> kind of chemicals that, um, that are really dose dependent, that that really should only, these should be applied by professionals, hire a certified arborist. These chemicals, you need to be certified by the state of Vermont's Agency of Agriculture to apply pesticides. And these two are the non-neonicotinoid options, which means they, are, they will have the lowest impact on pollinators possible as far as, they, will, they, they are chemical, they will have an impact on um, anything that's feeding on that tree, but, um, EAB included in that. So it's, a, again, a decision that you need to weigh your values versus your long-term goal for the trees. Um, and it's, it, it, you do need to do it every two years. It does go down to every three years once the populations go down. Um, but <clears throat> I'm going to have just a couple minutes. So what I just want to real quick, I'm going to skip over forest land. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to go to the budget sheet because I think you're probably curious about costs. Um, inventorying is really important, so for those of you, um, Montpelier has had an inventory forever. East Montpelier is doing one, Plainfield, we're going to do one, Marshfield, we'll get there. So this is just, you know, we're working with a lot of towns now. We have an app that you can download on a smartphone. We have iPads that we loan out to towns to do inventory, just so you have an idea of what your numbers are. Um, this is the budget sheet. So. Um, for removals, it's, it, we don't have great data on what rural, rural roadside removals cost or what f um, removals in like a high density ash situation look like. This is from the Forest Service. If you have, this is talking about like individual trees that an arborist would come and, and take down. Um, I've, for, for like a rural road situation or a dense situation, I know some arborists are actually walk, walk, they have to walk that specific mile of road or half mile of road and um, give a price like per quarter mile, depending on the density and the elevation and the size of the trees, et cetera. Um, the insecticide treatment, which is probably the price point that you're most interested in hearing about, um, it should be, if you're hiring a certified arborist to do it, it should be between $12 and $15 um, per diameter inch of tree. And you really don't want to treat anything less than 10 inches in diameter. Um, 
that unless, unless it's a tree that has extremely high personal significance to you and you really want to keep that tree. But so if you had a 20 inch tree at um, $12, you're, that's 240 bucks every, every other year to treat that tree. Um, the low end on this, the $3, places like Montpelier, like Rutland City, they are having city staff um, get their insecticide license, pesticide applicator's license, and they can buy the chemical direct because they are now licensed to do so. So that allows a place like Rutland City, who is treating 100 of their street trees over the long term, that allows them to do that at that $3 price point and not at the $15 per diameter inch price point. This information is all up on our website. Um, just really quickly, some, some examples of what's happening. You know, Montpelier, again, has been extremely active um, in inventorying the ash trees. They have a plan for slowing the spread. Um, the, infestation, the infested trees in Montpelier are up on National Life's campus at the Agency of Natural Resources headquarters, which is a little ironic, found by our state forest health lead. Um, the three trees that are, were visibly infested have been removed, and the other trees around that have been treated. But um, the whole, uh, the woods between National Life and downtown, there's gonna be a lot of monitoring that's happening in there this summer. They're hanging a bunch of traps because they just wanna make sure they're aware of where the, how that population's moving into, into town. Williston. Um, in 2015, did an inventory, 51% of their street trees were ash, green ash. On this wildflower circle, 99% of the trees were ash. They have been preemptively removing and replacing those trees since 2015. So that's an approach that this community is taking. And again, that's just, um, they're, they're taking care of, it's not gonna be an issue for them once it gets to Williston because all of their green ash are gonna be gone. Um, Charlotte, again, I mentioned they're doing the first community that I know of that sent out an actual RFP um, for preemptive rural, rural ash tree removal. Um, and they have a really active tree warden. And this is, they have a tree war Charlotte tree warden website where if you're looking for resources from a town that's really actively planning, that's more rural, not a city, they're a great example of how they're engaging the community. Um, um, and I talked about Rutland City. The cool thing that's happening in Burlington is that um, I live in a neighborhood that's very close to another neighborhood that has 100% green ash on their streets. And what the city's doing is actually, they're not removing anything now, they're not gonna treat anything, but they're interplanting with a, a diversity of about 15 species so that once EAB, and this is something a landowner could do, a homeowner, you could start, you could plant, a small tree now, understanding that within 10 years that ash is gonna be gone and you wanna have something there that can take over for it. So those are just some strategies. Um, I already showed you our websites. And the last thing I'll just mention, I know we're over time, is that um, we're doing a really cool um, kind of collaboration with Vermont Land Trust where we're starting to gather stories about notable ash trees in the state. Uh, we have a web or an email address started up called it's at ash at vlt.org, and we're really at this point just seeking stories, photos, poems, anecdotes about these these magnificent and notable ash trees across the state because um, we know that they're there. I hear from people in workshops all the time. My grandma planted this ash tree on our property, and it's now. 85 years old and it's next to the house and you know those are the kind of things that we're really looking for and we're gonna uh, have some big exhibit at some point but for now we're just collecting the stories. Um, your five takeaways, VT invasives, EAB is gonna kill ash trees, we're on the cusp of the infestation, the first step in planning is knowing how to ID and do an inventory, um, we can protect high value trees, we can keep ash on the landscape, we just need to be in a planning mode and then um, EAB infested trees are risky, so stay safe. I'm over, but <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and if anybody has any final questions or. Um, oh, Norman, I had a quick question. When you do sample the bark on living trees, yeah. does that create any long term damage yes. to the tree? Yes, okay. it does. That's why it's the last. You know, we're only gonna we're only gonna peel the bark if we, we're pretty sure, okay. we're we're very sure that it's that it's we're gonna find a gallery. Yeah.
if you said oh, that the it goes into the little sprouts, mm -hmm. whatever, I guess you remove those when you remove the big tree as well. Well, they come up after, so they would they would oh. they would sprout after that tree has been cut down. So you, then you have to go cut those. Down. You just maintaining, yeah. Okay, so you never really totally exactly remove it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It, is, it is eventually going to spread throughout the state. I yes. think it's inevitable. Yes. How long do you see that cycle taking? Um, I think it depends a lot on how seriously people take the slow the spread recommendations. Um, you know, it's there are Wisconsin has had EAB for maybe 10, 12 years, and it's still confined to a very small area of the state. Um, they've been really diligent about making sure wood is infested wood's not leaving an area. So, and then there are other states that haven't been so successful in doing that, and it's spread very rapidly. So I, there's no way to know. I think it, it's, we're depending a lot on people following our guidelines and um, really keeping an eye on how the populations are moving and growing. Is there, is there any way to develop a ash borer resistant tree? I mean, can buy well, that's that's that crossbreeding. So that's happening. So they're taking res trees that are showing some tolerance or resistance naturally of the native U.S. Spe North American species. They're um, taking cuttings from those, taking um, the, the native Asian varieties and crossbreeding them. So they're developing essentially new species of ash uh, that will be resistant, um, but are not yet on the landscape. Yeah. So there's hope. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you all.